This is the fifth video in a series in which I'm attempting to repair an HP 9830A desktop calculator. In this video I finally get around to starting to fault find and track down the issues which are preventing this unit from running. In the previous video I cleaned the unit, uh, repaired and tested the power supply and uh, that all was working fine. Even with all the cards fitted the power supply rails were still as they should be. Uh, but currently the display is not showing any activity and the unit appears to be dead. Unfortunately a system like this the fault could be something very simple or something very complex. It's kind of an all or nothing to a certain degree with a machine like this simply because the circuits are so complicated that they are all interdependent. What I intend to do is, as I work my way through the machine is describe each card and its function before I start testing it and then I'll fully test the card as far as I can. It is difficult to test them in isolation but um, I'll do that as much as I can just to try and clarify exactly the way they work. I will be relatively brief in my explanations uh, simply because the machine so complex if I go into a lot of detail then these videos would uh, run on forever and uh, I'm sure they'd get very boring. Uh, however, if you're interested in knowing more about this machine, there are some fairly good uh, online resources and some um, more information that you can find for this particular machine. As I said, much of the electronics needs to work in this unit before it will work at all and certainly before it will display anything on the display. And as I work my way through the machine, I'll try and keep the progress as orderly as possible in order to make its operation as clear as possible. Now I've already dealt with the power supply and normally in a system like this you'd move on to the uh, clock generator. But I'm going to skip over the clock generator just for now. I'll look at that in the next video and it will hopefully become clear as we go through this video why I'm doing that. Although there are a lot of cards in this machine, the actual CPU part of it consists of just four cards of this size. This is one of them and what I'm going to do is look at each one in turn and focus on the CPU itself. Now looking at just the CPU cards means that the system overall won't be able to run but what I want to do is to fully test the CPU cards and make sure that they're working the way they should before I move on to the rest of the system and start adding cards which will of course make it more complicated to fault find with. If you've watched my other videos on the transistor processor or read the associated book then the microcode generator in the 9830A is equivalent to the control matrix in the transistor processor. I won't go into the full operation of the processor at this point um, but as a brief explanation a processor can be considered to be a collection of electronic modules which are accessed in order and in a certain fashion to perform specific tasks such as moving data in and out of memory and carrying out specific actions on that data. The sequencing of those functions is controlled in the transistor processor by the control matrix and the control matrix is in turn controlled by the code which is present in the program memory of the computer. The control matrix decides which modules are accessed and when and how each processor cycle is organized and carried out. It is the control matrix which gives the processor the ability to execute user code and also gives the processor the flexibility to make decisions. So it's not all hard coded and uh, the code doesn't have to be performed in a linear fashion from start to finish. It can branch and uh, as I say make decisions. Now the transistor processor only had a handful of instructions, it was limited to just 10 instructions. But as systems get bigger and with the uh, 9830A um, which has uh, a lot more instructions then the uh, need for the control matrix to become more complex rapidly increases. Now like the transistor processor the 9830A has a control matrix it's uh, called a microcode engine in the uh, documentation for the uh, 9830 but it performs pretty much the same task within the CPU it's just the part of the system that 
provides all the control uh, lines, control circuits and timing for the way that the system operates. Deciding which board to start with was the first decision and I've start, I decided to actually look at the microcode generator as the first board to try and fault find with. And that's this board and what I'll do is go over the, um, the circuit to this board before we start looking at fault finding. And it's I think key to potentially successfully re repairing this machine or machines like this to understanding the basics of how the, um, the system works. It's such a complex machine that if you start just guessing and prodding and poking around it's very unlikely you'll successfully get it repaired unless you're extremely lucky. Now to keep the complexity of the electronic circuits down what HP did was to put a huge amount of the functionality of the microcode engine into ROMs. So the ROM code in these seven ROMs contains the uh, functionality steps, if you like, for the microcode unit. That is, these seven ROMs uh, contain code that provide the instruction set for the CPU and they determine when certain control lines are asserted, uh, when certain things happen and in what order. And that is dependent on the instruction that is being read from uh, main memory. The important thing here is to understand that the code in these ROMs and in the microcode unit are not the system code. These are just uh, ROMs that contain code to drive the CPU microcode unit and they have nothing to do with the system code that runs and that the user uh, actually provides or interacts with. These are kind of fixed and uh, in theory could replace these with um, electronics but obviously that would create a far more complex circuit. Before I start describing the circuit and how it works I thought it might be helpful to have a brief look at the instruction set as this does go hand in hand with the way that the microcode unit works. Uh, specifically the encoding of the instructions. If you are familiar with the transistor processor you'll know that the instructions in that machine are encoded into 8 bits um, with possibly a follow-on 8 bits of data. In this machine each instruction is encoded into 28 bits just a single 28-bit word and the uh, meaning or the purpose of each of the bits is described in this document. This is an online resource that you can download, it's extremely useful. Um, but these um, bits that comprise the instruction are actually contained in these seven ROMs. So these are 4-bit ROMs and there are 28 bits in each instruction. So 7 times 4 is 28. So uh, obviously the way that these um, ROMs are configured is they are all effectively addressed together. So the address pins are all wired together on these 7 ROMs. So when you select a particular address uh, for the ROMs then they all output data that constitutes a particular 28-bit instruction. Each of the bits for the instruction perform specific tasks. So what we'll do now is look at the circuit and see what each of those um, sets of four bits do. Um, but ultimately they are all there to provide the functionality of a control matrix. And I'll now look at the um, schematic and see um, exactly how that uh, is implemented in this particular machine. As I say this is kind of key before we start doing any fault finding otherwise we won't know if the unit's working or not. So this is the schematic for the microcode unit and what I'll do is very briefly go over the way that it, uh, it functions. So these are the um, seven ROMs. We have two here and we have another five over here. And they all work together. If you look at the schematic you'll see there's a, a bus down here called microcode bus and that's this same bus on this schematic. And what it really does is just connects all the address lines together for all seven ROMs. So they're all 
being driven by a common address bus. Uh, following a, a reset of the machine, then the address bus register, which comprises of these eight flip-flops, is reset to give an output of 1717 octal, and that's FF hex. And that is the reset vector for this particular CPU. So, as I say, this is the register. So this block of ICs is effectively the um, address register for the microcode. They're just discrete flip-flops and wired with the J and K inputs together. So they are in toggle mode. So that means that the output will just toggle in response to the input whenever the uh, clock cycle occurs and they are all clocked together so it's kind of a synchronous register. The output of these drives the microcode bus so in other words whatever the bit pattern is coming out of these flip-flops is the address that's fed into all seven ROMs and that selects the particular 28-bit instruction that the microcode unit is currently going to run. One thing that's worth pointing out um, here is that this is a, a serial CPU. So most of the registers in it are loaded and read in a serial fashion. We'll come back to that another time. It is important in understanding how the um, machine works. Okay, so once the reset occurs, then the incoming clock will cause the microcode unit to cycle round the code that is in the ROMs. And one thing you can see straight away here is that the output of these two ROMs is fed back into, if we ignore this for now, is fed back into the input of the register. And the reason it does that is it means that the uh, microcode code can determine what the next instruction is to be executed. In other words, it can modify its own address and that allows it to jump to different addresses. Now these two chips are here to allow the jump instructions to be modified. So in other words, rather than just blindly jumping to a fixed address, the address that the code actually jumps to can be modified based on the state of the, the CPU. So the top one is a kind of block change that allows the, the target address to be changed and the bottom multiplexer responds to the incoming status bits. So as with any processor you have um, results of certain actions and they will vary depending on the code that's been run. And these two chips allow decision making. So in other words, the uh, microcode unit can jump to different addresses depending on the overall status of the uh, machine. So I won't go into the detailed operation of this. It's, it's probably fairly clear looking at this and it become clearer as we see what each of these lines uh, actually does. This incidentally, if you're looking at the master chart or master diagram for this processor, is this is the Q register, and it has certain specific functions that are to do with um, responding to different status requirements in the CPU. Uh, and they're fed into this multiplexer, and this is used to modify the uh, lowest bit in the microcode bus register. And these bits are, as I said, just um, uh, they change in response to the status of the previous actions of the CPU. So this organization of having this, these bits fed back and allowing it to respond to the status bits within the machine allows the microcode unit to effectively make decisions as to how it's going to perform the next step within the microcode sequence. But again, bear in mind, this is not the system code that's running here. This is just the code that drives the microcode unit. Okay, so just as, as an example of what some of these um, blocks of four bits do. I mentioned earlier that I wasn't going to look at the clock circuit first. 
and the reason for that is if we look at one of the ROMs, that's one of these seven ROMs, is uh, this device and the four bits coming out of it are labelled CC1, CC2, CC4, CC8. If we look at the clock generator schematic, which is this, you'll see those same four bits come into this device. This is used as a divider within the clock circuit. circuit so we have the master clock going out. The same clock then goes through this divider and the output then goes through and is used to drive the microcode unit. What this mechanism allows is the microcode unit can load whatever um, bit pattern it wants on these for each instruction, each microcode instruction. And that means that for each instruction it can load this divider with whatever division value it wants and this is configured as a down counter so this is loaded with a value. It then counts down and then when it's counted down it toggles the output. The reason this is here is in the 9830A instructions can be variable length so they can be anything from 1 up to 16 bits and in theory you could run them all at 16 bits and just idle away any cycles that you don't want but this system being serial is already ser seriously compromised in terms of speed so HP did everything they could to uh, improve the performance and that means rather than idling away unwanted uh, processor cycles what it does is it just sets the number of um, bits that are required for each particular instruction and then it terminates that instruction once that number of bits is completed. In other words, it makes best use of the system by only running as many clock cycles as it needs to for each particular instruction. And it does that by loading this divider. We'll come back to the clock generator in the next video, but um, that's why I didn't start with this, otherwise it would have been hard to explain uh, what this uh, mechanism here was doing. And of course the other ROMs provide other bits that perform other tasks within the system. And these five ROMs all work together to provide the sequencing of control lines that are required to perform the various tasks that each instruction requires. Again, if you haven't um, seen the transistor processor videos, then it would be well worth looking at those or, or even getting a copy of the book because that does explain in some detail um, how the control lines in a microprocessor are used to control the overall operation of the machine. Okay, so that's this in brief. Now, if you want me to go over this in more detail, then um, post a comment and I'll come back to it. But um, so I don't want to get uh, too long-winded with this if uh, we need to come back to this and look at it in more detail as part of the fault-finding process then I'll do that later uh, otherwise I'll just give uh, brief explanations and then we'll move on to the next card. So the next step uh, in fault-finding this card of course is to fit it to the machine. Now I don't have the risers yet to enable me to connect the logic analyzer to this card with it out of the machine this particular card is quite useful in that it has this test connector at the top. So it's a 20-way connector and that is connected to these points. So it will enable me to connect the logic analyzer with the card plugged in. And it also gives a good insight into what the microcode unit is doing. So if, uh, for example, I can capture or trigger on a certain address and then we can compare that with the expected contents of the seven ROMs and see if that's what they're actually outputting uh, by monitoring these lines or even directly monitoring the output of the ROMs themselves. So that's what I'll do next. I had intended to do that in this video but it's already got a bit too long so I'll do that in the next video. I'll put this into the machine, connect up the logic analyzer and we'll finally get round to looking at some, uh, hopefully some activity uh, within the CPU system.